Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, the New York Times and the Palestine-Israel story. When the ground war began on a Saturday night, should this reporter be reassigned for conflict of interest? Kenya, after the election violence of 2008. And welcome to the big story. Reforming the media to prevent it from happening again. Iceland is a cold country, but it might become the best place in the world to avoid libel chill. Protection laws for journalists. And a web video of the week that fits us to a T. Our lead story this week is about a newspaper reporter. One reporter whose story was broken on a website traveled to the pages of his own paper and ignited a debate amongst not just its readers, but also its editors. The newspaper is the New York Times, and the reporter is Ethan Bronner. Bronner is a Jewish American. As the Times' Jerusalem bureau chief reporting on one of the biggest stories in the world, he holds one of the most prestigious jobs that print journalism has to offer. The story that broke, Bronner's American-born son has volunteered to join the Israeli army. The Times' public editor, who deals with readers' complaints, wrote a column recommending that Bronner be reassigned, given a different posting, because of the appearance of conflict of interest. However, the editor of the paper, Bill Keller, wrote a column in response, saying that Bronner will stay in the job. Our starting point this week is an apparent conflict of interest in Jerusalem and how the most influential newspaper in America is choosing to deal with it. The New York Times does have a point of view on the Palestine-Israel story. Over the years, its editorial writers have clearly been pro-Israel, but the paper has always maintained that its reporting, its news coverage, has been down the middle. And the paper tried to maintain the appearance of objectivity as its editors argued over what to do with Ethan Bronner. It was really remarkable that a paper like the New York Times um, had a public debate about this issue. At the same time, we can't forget that they weren't forthcoming with it before an independent website in this case, uh, Electronic Intifada actually broke the story and, in a sense, compelled New York Times to generate a response to that. We contacted the New York Times twice and requested interviews with Ethan Bronner or his editor. We received no response. But here's how the paper's public editor described Ethan Bronner's potential conflict of interest. He said Bronner occupies one of journalism's hottest seats for America's most influential newspaper. Everything he writes is examined microscopically for signs of bias, and now his son has taken up arms for one side. I have enormous respect for Bronner and his work, and he has done nothing wrong. But this is not about punishment. It is simply a difficult reality. I would find a plum assignment for him somewhere else, at least for the duration of his son's service. And here's how the paper's chief editor responded. Much as I respect your concern for appearances, we will not be taking your advice to remove Ethan Bronner from the Jerusalem Bureau. It's not just that we are reluctant to capitulate to the more savage partisans who make that assignment so difficult. Our policies require us to pay attention to potential conflicts of interest or appearances of such conflict. Editors take those policies very seriously, but our policies are designed to make us alert, not to preempt our professional judgment. It's a testy response. He calls people who disagree with them savage partisans. He is somewhat disrespectful of, of the Times' own ombudsman. It's not a well-thought-out argument. Maybe that's because there's really not a good argument for their decision to keep Bronner in his place. Ethan Bronner faced questions about impartiality while on a recent speaking tour. At Vassar University in New York State, he talked about the struggle to find objective truth in the Palestine-Israel conflict. In a world which is typically black and white, he said, eye traffic in gray. Students asked about his son joining the Israeli military, and some accused Bronner of biased reporting. He is reported to have replied that if they disliked his articles, they should read other newspapers. Ethan Bronner is the Times' primary reporter on the Palestine-Israel story. The Bureau is in this anonymous building in West Jerusalem. His critics argue the fact that he spends most of his time on the Israeli side of the divide affects his work. The issue here has little to do with Bronner's Jewishness and more to do with the fact that he, in his life, is completely immersed in the Israeli horizon, that in his relationships and in his daily lived 
experience, he is completely and deeply connected to one side of the story in the Middle East. To his great credit, Ethan Bronner has written some of the more thoughtful and investigative articles about the situation there. I remember in particular one article about the settler movement, which was a searching and um, deeply reported article. Other Israel correspondents for the New York Times who have been Jewish have been able to step back and, and have that sense of distance. But the problem with Ethan Broner is that he clearly is very uncomfortable with the other side of this conflict. As evidence, Broner's critics cite stories like this one on the Times' website. It's about Israelis visiting an illegal West Bank settlement that the Israeli government ordered evacuated four years ago. It is technically illegal for Israelis to travel in these parts of the West Bank, but this group doesn't seem to mind. Bronner describes it as technically illegal, which I found a very interesting concept. You know, is it illegal or is it not, or what's exactly going on here? And what, what's technically illegal to Palestinians or people whose land is being stolen, you know? So I think that very term is, is kind of bemused and it's kind of uh, accepting. Then there's the use of Hebrew words that are not translated for a non-Jewish audience. The dormitories of the yeshiva are over there. A yeshiva is a Jewish Bible school. Today is a special day in Chomesh. The students completed an entire tractate of the Talmud. They dance the Hora and sing in celebration. The Talmud is a central text of Judaism, usually pertaining to Jewish law. But Bronner never explains that. There's nothing unethical about the report, but it is odd and rather telling. I think the terminology that Bronner uses is very indicative of his entire mindset. So I think that he is really writing and thinking about Jewish Americans, Israelis, how they will respond to his reporting. But I, I think it goes even beyond that. He, in general, uses Israeli terminology, and, and then that influences the media, I think, almost worldwide, sadly. A New York Times correspondent, Ethan Bronner, spent a day with an Israeli unit in northwest Gaza. In another video posted during the war in Gaza, Bronner was embedded with the Israeli military. When the ground war began on a Saturday night, they took... The Times has strict rules of attribution. If you report something you have not seen for yourself, you report who gave you the information. For most of this report, Bronner does not attribute to the Israeli military what he is reporting. A lot of it is agricultural land where they found uh, rocket launchers. In the houses, they found tunnels and booby traps and mannequins, all aimed at drawing Israeli soldiers in. And but it's not just the videos that concern Bronner's critics. This print piece on Gaza was also controversial. It was from El Atatra, where Bronner reported the Israeli military killed four children from the same family with white phosphorus, an anti-personnel bomb that many weapons specialists consider a chemical weapon. He wrote that what happened in El Atatra seemed like the painful but inevitable outcome of a modern army bringing war to an urban space. That provoked the writer behind this website to ask, since when is it inevitable that a modern army shower white phosphorus on civilians and burn them to a crisp? The writer was Richard Silverstein, a Jewish American who calls himself a strong supporter of Israel. He's shown in his reporting about Palestine and his reporting from Gaza, it's largely uh, skewed. He largely parrots a, a line provided to him by the IDF spokespeople and the government spokespeople. He doesn't probe into the contradictions very well in the line that's provided to him. Ethan Bronner's apparent conflict of interest is thoroughly examined on the Times' website, where 60 of the paper's readers commented on the story. Most want Bronner reassigned, but he has his defenders. One said Ethan should only be judged upon what actually appears in print and nothing else. He is a superb reporter. Another wrote, Bill Keller is not saying, trust us, we're the Times. He is saying readers should be trusted to see for themselves that Bronner isn't biased in his reporting. The comments were part of a fascinating online debate about ethics and journalism. But as one other reader put it, I somehow sense that if the son of a New York Times reporter were to join Hamas or Hezbollah, we would not be having this discussion. Here's how our Global Village Voices see the Ethan Bronner story. You're assuming that he's impartial to begin with. He's not. He's a liberal. He's a reporter for the New York Times, which is not impartial in their reporting. 
They have an agenda. Our Global Village Voice platform gives you the chance to take your opinions on the media into more than 180 million homes worldwide. The best way to get in touch with us for that is through Facebook and Twitter. We'll let you know via those sites what stories we're working on, or you can just get in touch with us via email. We're at listeningpost at aljazeera.net anytime you want to get with the program. Time now for Listening Post News Bites, starting with a story that could affect what you see in the news no matter where you live. The North Atlantic country of Iceland looks like it's set to become to journalism what the Cayman Islands and Bermuda are to the wealthy, a haven that offers protection. But rather than providing protection from taxes, it would protect reporters and publishers from harsh libel laws. The Icelandic parliament has introduced a law that would put the country in the forefront of investigative journalism by offering source protection, legally, freedom of speech, and protection from frivolous libel prosecutions. The law would allow media outlets from any country to register a home office in Iceland and publish their work online from there and thereby avoid being exposed to more restrictive libel laws such as those in the UK. The Icelandic government has been working with WikiLeaks, that's the online whistleblowing site, on the law. Here's how WikiLeaks' Daniel Schmidt described the initiative a couple of months ago. We're taking the source protection laws from, me, uh, from Sweden. We could take the First Amendment from the United States. We could take Belgium protection laws for journalists. The goal, according to Schmidt, is to use the Icelandic haven to spread similar laws throughout the European Union. In a not unrelated story, the Turkish government of Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan has promised to improve the state of media freedoms there. But a court has just sentenced a Kurdish newspaper editor to 21 years in prison. Ozan Kilinch, the editor of the Kurdish language paper Azadiya Welat, was convicted of publishing 12 editions of the paper with references to the PKK, the Kurdistan Workers' Party, that wants independence from Turkey. In the ruling, the judges deemed that the references to the PKK were tacit support for a terrorist movement. The left-wing paper, which is published in Diyarbakir, is no stranger to the Turkish courts. It's been shut down five times in the past, and just last month, two of its reporters were charged with links to the PKK. Prime Minister Erdogan's government knows that one of the primary arguments being made against Turkey's application for membership to the European Union centers on Turkey's restrictions on the media, both in law and how those laws are interpreted by the courts. The Kilinch conviction will certainly not help Turkey's case with the EU. The political protests in Iran after the election back in June was one of the world's top news stories last year. Now a picture from that story has taken first prize in the World Press Photo Awards. The shot was taken by an Italian freelancer, Pietro Masturzo, and it captured Iranian women taking to a rooftop in Tehran and shouting support to protesters on the streets below. One judge said it won because the photo captures the beginning of what turned into a huge story. It added perspective and carried a visual and emotional impact. Venezuela's president, Hugo Chavez, is at it again, on the airwaves. He's not content to have his own TV and radio show, Allo Presidente, which has been known to run as long as eight hours at a time, so he's starting another radio show called Suddenly with Chavez. As the title would suggest, this is not a regularly scheduled broadcast. At any time, day or night, stations will suddenly switch to Chavez, and it will be up to listeners to decide if they suddenly want to switch channels. The Venezuelan leader is a bit of an air hog, however his supporters defend his communication strategy by arguing that even though Chavez controls state-run outlets in Venezuela, his opponents control the bulk of the private channels and they're always out to get him. We're back after the break with a look at Kenya, where the media were broken, and there's a debate about how to get the story right. Welcome back. We've been keeping a pretty close eye on the media in Kenya ever since the post-election violence in 2008 and the role that local radio stations were accused of playing in the fighting. More than 1,500 people were killed, some 300,000 displaced from their homes, and the allegation against the media was that some vernacular radio stations allowed partisans to broadcast messages of hate, inciting some of that violence. Kenya is now at the midpoint between that election and the next vote, in 2012, a good time we thought to go back there. We found a government that wants to break up some large media groups into smaller, less influential players, and we found media outlets who are resisting what they call too much government control over what they broadcast. The Listening Post's Salah Qadar now on the struggle for the control of the media in Kenya. <laughs> Kenya has a large and vibrant media sector. 
Every morning in downtown Nairobi, people pour over the latest details of the country's constitution talks, or a corruption scandal, or sports news. It seems to be a free market, but how free is it? In fact, the media sector in Kenya is dominated by a handful of conglomerates which control most of the television, print and radio outlets. And they're often backed by strong political interests. In the industry in Kenya, there is about five big broadcasters, media houses um, that dominate uh, pretty much most of the information flow. In much of Africa, radio is the principal medium. Kememi FM was the first privately owned radio station in Kenya allowed to broadcast in a language other than English or Kiswahili. During the violence that followed the elections in December 2007, the Kikuyu language station was accused, along with other vernacular stations, of broadcasting negative and disrespectful references to other ethnic groups, language that fueled the violence. Today, Kememi FM says it can control callers, despite having no delay on transmission. Basically, we have ground rules that when you're calling me, you're discussing the issue. We're not discussing a person. We know we have ground rules. If you get out of board, we cut you and we talk to the next person. Mindful of the power of the media and the role that they played in post-election violence in 2008, Kenya has tried to introduce legislation on everything from ownership and licenses to the revelation of sources, often provoking an outcry in the media. A commission of inquiry into the post-election violence uh, found that uh, the media, uh, for sure, uh, did uh, fan the flames uh, of uh, ethnic uh, tension amongst us. But we didn't see the media industry uh, uh, or the Media Owners Association or even the Media Council uh, taking that to heart. The Nation Media Group is one of the biggest players in the country, covering radio, television and print. The Nation is probably the most independent of all the media in this country simply because the majority of the shares are owned by the Alcon, which is an outside entity. But the other media companies are either individually owned or a group of people that have political interests and therefore, I think, compromise their reporting considerably. Easy FM, hello? The company's chief executive officer says regulators are determined to break up the industry into smaller, more manageable units by whatever means they can. In in terms of having a, a regulatory mechanism, looking at content, nobody objects to it. The question is who should do it. What we have in these regulations is you've got Communications Commission of Kenya that gives you the frequencies and then that uh, looks over at what you're doing. And uh, if they don't like what you're doing, the same Communications Commission of Kenya can withdraw uh, that frequency. That's not any different from having an imperial presidency. KTN was the first privately owned television station in Kenya. It's now part of the Standard Media Group, an organization associated with the opposition. In 2006, it was raided after being accused of publishing a story critical of President Kibaki's regime. Raiding KTN was an important precedent, a dramatic precedent in the history of the media in the country. Government agents came in, took our computers away, took, certain, uh, took our servers away, trashed our, our, our offices, um, went to our printing press, burnt newspapers, and the headline was about um, exam results. In, in some ways, the government feels very stung by KTN and KTN's reportage and is using the media bill to legislate us out of business. The government says the criticism of its media policy is misguided. Its public face is Batanga in demo. He says that legislation is designed to create a level playing field and that opposition from the large media groups is fueled by commercial interests. Usually, the, if you find the reasons why uh, they are making noise sometimes, it is because of selfish interests. Uh, those who invested in the sector and who have a comparative advantage over the newcomers, they would want the status quo to remain. Those who, who are already comfortable in the sector, that is where the problems are coming from. One of the paradoxes of uh, democracies in Africa is that as elections become uh, more competitive, uh, they're also more likely to be contested and possibly more violent. 
So the role of the media has to be understood as part of this complex dance between political forces and social forces. The role played by media in the violence of two years ago showed how powerful media can be. The Kenyan government wants to make sure that mechanisms are in place to prevent a repeat. But it seems unlikely that the new laws will prevent politicians from increasing their influence over media outlets in the run-up to the next election, which puts the responsibility largely on the media themselves. We have stated very clearly in the legislation that political parties or politicians should not own frequencies. Uh, but I cannot tell you that they don't own because they do it through proxies. And welcome to The Big Story. I am Jeff Koinange. This and media, this fourth estate as they call it, we have to play our role to make sure, look, temperatures don't rise the way they did in 07. People are sensitized, people know their rights. Um, and the change that, you know, that will come, hopefully will come, is change for the whole country. And we have to play our role. And if we don't, we'll only have ourselves to blame. All Kenyan. All the time. Finally, you might not think of it this way when you put one on in the morning, but t-shirts are a form of modern media. They often convey a message that says something about you, about your politics, your taste in music, even your sense of humor. And depending on the design, t-shirts can also be an art form. Rhett and Link clearly get that. There are a couple of American comics from North Carolina. Their new stop-motion video has racked up more than a million and a half YouTube hits in just over a week. Rhett and Link's T-Shirt War is a viral video phenomenon, making it our web offering for this week. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post.